possibly take. And that committee will make their recommendations to our executive committee and then on to our full board of directors. And in November of each year, our board of directors then does um, put their final stamp of approval on that document. And that's why we roll it out in January. So that's just kind of our process. So if you're interested in being involved, see any one of our team members in the back and they will make sure that um, you get on that um, schedule so that you know when those round tables are. I also want to do a shout out to Vincent here behind me. Vincent is our intern. on public policy interns. You know, I take a look over the past several years where our interns have gone. We've got them at the Corporation Commission. We've got them at the Secretary of State. We've got them at the governor's office, we've got them all over. So we're really proud of where our public policy interns um, end up and we strive to keep that program um, strong and growing. So at this time, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce one of our board members um, and our Healing Cruise with Salt River Project. She is actually one of the co-chairs for our public policy committee and she's gonna be taking the first round of this program. So. Put your hands together and welcome you. There it was. Keep on right. So, better? Yeah. Right. Well, good morning. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us for the policy meeting this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with Legislative District um, 12. And I'm going to have one question for all our legislators, and then we can move on to any questions from the audience afterwards. So let's start with um, System Minority Leader, Senator B.T. Epstein, please. And the question is, with the over 900 bills that have been introduced so far as a legislature, what is your top priority to work across the aisle on? And so if, if, or if you have any of you, you want to talk about a priority, just go ahead and share with us for a few minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning. Well, thank you. I am Mitzi Epstein. I'm a computer systems analyst by trade. I work for huge corporations like the Treasury Department at Citicorp, and I run a small business called Custom Language Training. It is mostly on hiatus since I've been in the legislature where I am the ranking member on the Finance Committee of the Senate now, and I was previously ranking on the Ways and Means. It's all about revenue for me. I always tell newcomers, these two committees are the education funding committees, because that's what we need to do when you bring the revenue in before we can help our kids grow into strong parts of our community going forward. So uh, a, a huge priority of mine is always funding our schools adequately. So one of the disappointments from last year was that it, the best story is I, you know, a teacher who was so happy to get a 79% raise. That is really terrific. It just feels so good. I hated to, and didn't even tell her, inflation is 9%. So that's the situation that our schools are faced with. Yes, there was big improvements, but we are still behind when it comes to inflation, and that means that Whatever amount of dollars we're getting them, they could buy fewer pencils and desks and obviously pay for teachers. It's still a really important problem we need to address. Um, so, colleagues passed the budget, and uh, what my number one priority is that we pass a budget that will help the people of Arizona. The do nothing budget does not. I see Senator Messner is here, so I'm sure he'll want to tell you what. He thinks their budget does, and I'm the, it was basically continue most of the funding from last year without any of all the one-time funding, which were the parts the Democrats thought, well, this will bring some help to some people. So, of course, we wouldn't know why. But the budget really is where it's all at. And for me, it's schools, housing, and water. You may have heard that uh, the Colorado River system, there's seven states all together in that pact. Six of us got together and said, let's have an agreement. This is how we'll deal with the fact that we have a lot less water in that river than we did before. California said, mm, you know, the law, the law is saying that we get the most, so we're just going to keep on taking the most. Uh, this is my interpretation. 
Um, we have a long way to go, but our friends on the board of the Central Arizona Project are very feeling positive that we'll get there. So thank goodness for the good work they keep doing. The legislature is going to keep working with them. And in the meantime, we need to do some work on groundwater because we have in the state been just mining the water out of our aquifers and not putting it back enough. And that's how we get sinkholes. And that's how we create problems of so many of our towns getting dry dust coming out of their faucet. So we need to work on water, groundwater, and Colorado River water. We need to help our schools be funded adequately, and we've got to come up with some better solutions for housing than what we've done so far. But I know everybody in the legislature is focused on affordable housing, and I think that we're going to have some good solutions. Stacy Travers. Uh, gosh, it, it was it, it's amazing to think that it was just a year ago that I was sitting here talking to you all again um, as a candidate with Senator Bowie and the you guys. Um, Senator uh, Epstein has covered some of the topics. I am on the Natural Resources and Energy Water Committee. I'm also on Military Affairs and Public Safety. I'm the co chair of Veterans Caucus. But uh, some of the things that I took away from last year's talk was. Um, some of the issues that are important to you as part of the community chamber. And one of those things are some protection to the tall building owners, uh, trying to find a way to streamline some city council ordinances, uh, which I look forward to working with uh, our fantastic city council on, and uh, some health protection. Uh, that was going to be a bit of a harder sell, but I'm trying. And we also, I also have several veterans uh those that are coming through the pipeline because we just talked about this the other day at the veterans caucus um the demographic of veterans tends to be the one of the largest rainbow coalitions ever because as veterans we have hispanic veterans we have african-american veterans we have gay veterans we have female veterans um there really isn't a part of society that hasn't been represented uh, within the veteran community so as part of veterans caucus we're trying to kind of streamline it Make it a little bit more uh, all cattle, all cattle, and not all hat, no cattle. Um, but if there's anything else that you guys, as a chamber, have issues with, then please come to us. Let us know. I will listen to open. And um, and on that note, you know, education, obviously, uh, water. There's some things I'm working on right now that we can't talk about, but we'll you know sign it up. And um, housing, you know, all the issues that we all have in common. So thank you very much. So we're going to move on to um, Representative Kathy Lopez. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heidi Ferris, and uh, I am on the Transportation and Infrastructure uh, Committee, and we. <laughs> so uh, excited to be down at the state capitol. Uh, this is uh, new to me, so learning the, the process has been interesting, to say the least. So uh, uh, kind of getting my, my feet wet over there, trying to figure out how to uh, how to navigate amongst everybody. And uh, been reading a lot of bills, been uh, going to a lot of committee meetings. I have one today at 9 o'clock. <laughs> So or a briefing today, but uh, it's it's been it's been an interesting experience, hoping to be able to reach across the aisle to, to get some of the programs that I've uh, I've proposed uh, through. Uh, one thing that one of the my constituents came to me about was school gardening, and I thought, well, that's a great idea. Let's do some school gardens. So a lot of schools have gardens already, but there's no uh, hub for it, someplace in the uh, state that can. Uh, uh, kind of give out information, curriculum, uh, help uh, coordinate with, uh, with farmers and other agricultural groups and all. So uh, there's, I have a couple bills for that. So that's something I thought could, could help people throughout the state and in our local areas here too, in our local schools. So I thought that was kind of fun to do. Um, but of course, we're hoping to have our ADL passed, and uh, I'm sure Senator uh, Paulus will talk a little bit more about that. And Senator Epstein already mentioned about the schools. 
it's a big issue that we need to address. In our transportation and infrastructure, um, I, I keep uh, mentioning, as I should say, mentioning the Prop 400 e which is the, the, the tax, the continuation of the tax to, to fund up our, our infrastructure and roads here in Maricopa County. Uh, my point being that uh, if Maricopa County takes care of their own, then the money that the state puts into infrastructure and other roads can be better spread out from our general fund. Uh, this is just a continuation of that tax. It's not a new tax. And uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, <coughs> former Governor Lucy uh, uh, vetoed that last year, and we want to try to make sure that we get that on. There is a little bit of fuss about it with the uh, uh, light rail. Uh, we need light rail. We're, we're extending light rail to Phoenix and to Glendale and to Mesa and hopefully down different areas, but uh, that's, that's going to be a very important issue uh, down the road. <laughs> um, so please we'll, uh, keep your eyes on that one. If we don't pass that, then that really kind of sucks the funds from other uh, issues out in the state. You know, so this is just a big, uh, big issue that we really need to address. Uh, let's see what else. I am um, I'm in Health and Human Services, hearing a lot of interesting bills there, and you know I'm I'm, uh, uh, I'm trying to be on that one. I really want to try to make sure that our seniors get uh, protected and, and have programs that we can make sure they can stay uh, safe and be able to put the feet in their homes um, as long as possible. And um, so area agency and aging is one thing I propose, make sure we keep that funding from the area agencies on aging. Uh, they have funding through the ARPA, uh, the federal funds, and we just need to make sure that they don't fall off that fiscal cliff next year. So we want to make sure that we can keep that funding too. So um, with that, I, I just want to say that it's, it's, uh, it's interesting being down there and having fun so, so far, and uh, we haven't gotten to the budget yet, so <laughs> that should be. The uh, <laughs> uh, exciting um, times to come. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Sandrina, and Rosie Flow. With us today. And so we're going to move on to LD 13, and I'm going to invite. Um, Senator Mike, can you share Senator Mesmer, please? What's the state? We're in a lot of work. They say yes. Yeah, pretty small room. I think we're okay. So I'm Katie Mesmer, State Senator from District 13. I chair the Finance Committee with Senator Kane, the ranking member. So we get to see a lot of each other, for better or for worse. So, um, <laughs> So this uh, week was pretty historic uh, for the legislature in the sense that the Senate did pass what we are referring to as a continuation budget. Now, there's a lot of characterization about what that means, so I just want to explain. It was historic in the fact that this is the earliest in modern history that the legislature is poised to send a, a budget to the governor's desk. Uh, the House is uh, prepared to do that on Monday. Um, the reason we're doing this, and by the way, it's also the earliest in the day. We got it done by 1.30 p.m. <laughs> no, not 1.30 a.m., so that was kind of nice. Um, we are in uh, a split government or shared government, depending on how you want to look at it. And what that likely means is a very long session. And typically, when you have long sessions, that means the budget's negotiation can, can drag on, and you get into May, and you get into June, and you start approaching July 1st, and you don't have a budget. And everybody freaks out, because come July 1st, if you don't have a budget, you have a shutdown of the government. So the thinking was, let's at least send up a budget that is built on last year's budget that passed with broad bipartisan support, that most everybody celebrated for one reason or another, sure there were things to criticize, but let's get that up. <laughs> And that's how we end the budget conversation. That just keeps the lights on come July 1st if you haven't uh, passed a subsequent budget right now. So that's what we are aiming to do. For those who think this is the end of the conversation, it would not be, maybe some would view it that way. I would not, and I think most.
those people would not. The governor certainly would not. Now, I don't know what she's going to do. There's a lot of speculation to veto it. If she does, and, and we're back to sort of the more traditional way, then it will mean, like it's back and forth, we'll get approaching July 1st with the brinksmanship that we've seen in the past, making everybody super uncomfortable. That's, that's what we're doing. Uh, and we, you know, folks can criticize that, but from my perspective, it makes so much sense that I did introduce a valid referral that would codify this. <laughs> so if the legislature goes along, what would happen is on the ballot in 2024 would be a proposal that says if you don't have a budget by July 1st, last year's budget is in effect until you pass a new budget. So that we can avoid this sort of thing that keeps happening year after year. And it happened the last two years in a Republican trifecta. So it's not unique to a, a shared government a scenario, but it happens enough to where it's in my time in office, it's one of those things I think we can avoid. The other thing I'll mention is that uh, I think it's likely on Monday the Senate will pass the AEL, the expenditure limits. I think the House is probably going to do it then as well. Uh, so we'll get that issue resolved. Um, but you know, the session is just getting started. Budget negotiations are just getting started, even if we do get this one to pass and <laughs> decide or not. Um, but I just want to add a little more context to what we might be reading out there or hearing. Uh, or another perspective than perhaps what the senator from District 12 can share. And with that, I think I'll ask us. Thank you very much. We're going to welcome now to Jennifer Perry. I'm going to use, can you hear me? Okay. I'm going to use this because I was ill last week, so my voice isn't 100% back. Um, first of all, I'm very, very happy to be at, um, at the House. Um, my number one priority is the people. Um, I truly am going to represent the people. And I call into my office both sides, or I, I, I accept the appointments from both sides. Your voice really matters. So I just want to make it clear, my number one priority is always the people. My second priority, obviously, is the budget, because that's what we're down there to do, to get the budget passed. I'm a little disappointed that we're working on the budget, because the Ledge Council has been clogged up. So a lot of my bills, you know, I have a deadline of Monday, and there's like this big clog in the system right now. Um, the three committees that I'm, I'm just being like very truthful, transparent, and honest. I, some of my bills that are very good bills may not even make it because of budget, but it's what we decided to do. Um, when um, we look at what committees I'm on, I'm on um, military affairs and law enforcement, very happy to be supporting our police. My barometer is when five-year-olds stop saying they want to be police officers when they grow up. That's something we really need to address. The second committee I'm on is the education, and I, I voted yes to pass AEL through committee. Um, we'll see what happens on Monday. Um, I am all for education. I'm just not very excited where Arizona stands. You know, when we measure Arizona to other states in the country, we have to be, we have to raise our standards. We have to be better in education. And I support the ESA voucher. And um, I hope to see um, Governor Hobbs not do anything with that because school choice is extremely important. And the last committee I am on, which is most near and dear to me, is municipal oversight and elections. I am sponsoring a bill, and in this bill, what it does is it change. This is a very, very important bill. It basically changes a lot of feedback that I get from both Republican and Democrat, and understand that election integrity is a nonpartisan issue. 2016, there was one side saying the elections were stolen. 2020, it was another side. So again, this affects both sides of the aisle. But one thing I'm constantly told is, well, Liz, the courts have not rendered any decision that there was something wrong. And until it goes through the court system, I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. So my personal experience over the last two years, all I have done with my life, is investigate this. And once you have seen things, you can't unsee them. 
and the issue with the court system and the statutes on election contesting an election is that the rules of civil procedure are not followed. You do not have discovery. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly and how the statute will change it. And I hope that this can be a nonpartisan issue. I feel, and let me just say, I know this should be relating to the chamber, but I just feel that when we get the people in the office and people are comfortable with, yes, these are the people that should truly be in office. I just feel like everything from education to law enforcement to water, it's it's just it's going to flow more naturally because people are going to have confidence in our elections. Okay, so let me talk about the, how it currently works. How it currently works is after it gets certified, you have five days to challenge an election. After that five days, you have 10 days to bring all of your evidence forward. You do not have discovery. The only thing we might consider discovery is you have an opportunity to send typically one person in to look at the ballots. In the last two cases, some of us have been following, one person had a, one election contester had a chance to examine about 100 ballots. The other person had the chance to examine ballots or send someone in to examine ballots for two and a half hours. Maricopa County this year, or 2022 had one point between 1.4 and 1.5 million ballots. What kind of discovery was that? So what I am proposing in my bill is basically to reverse that, to allow people discovery, to allow depositions of up to 10 people. And then when it comes to any, uh, any challenges of the courts for to go straight to the Supreme Arizona Supreme Court, and then that would open up if it's, applicable to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm just going to summarize what you could so I know some of you here truly understand what it is I'm talking about with elections. A lot of you are like, you're this right-wing conspiracy theorist. When I ran in 2020, in October of 2020, I thought, yeah, there's fraud in elections at like 0.05%. Now that I know what I've done, now that I've studied what I've studied for two years, this has got to be as big of a priority for me as the Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yes, wonderful. So I'm State Representative Jennifer Pollack. I'm beginning my third term in the Arizona House, and I'm serving as the ranking member on House Education, and I'm a member of the Ways and Means Committee, following in Senator Epstein's um, two steps. For me, the biggest priority truly is that we do something about the AGL. You've heard about this over and over for the past two years. It is a huge celebration that we passed a historic bipartisan budget last year. Lots of additional funding went into our schools with the agreement that we would settle the AEL, and we haven't done that yet. Now we have a deadline looming at the beginning of March that if we do not lift that cap temporarily, our schools will have to cut 17% of their budgets during the fourth quarter. What that means is that schools will have to do layoffs. Schools in rural areas may have to close. So particularly in the rural areas, it will be devastating to the economy when the largest employers in those areas will have to close down or lay off people. So we do have a bill that passed House Education this week that would temporarily lift the cap. We are hoping that it's going to be heard in rules Monday. So as the Senator said, we can vote on it as soon as possible. However, we don't want to be in the situation where every year we have to address the same issue. So I have proposed two bills that will reform the cap rather than repeal. A whole bunch of people have introduced bills to 
So in my case, we would be looking at excluding prop 301, and that's a bonus structure for teachers. It used to be excluded from the formula. It was expiring, so the legislature did the right thing. They continued it, but now it's not part of the formula, or it is part of the formula that needs to be removed. Another thing to consider is weighted student count. It doesn't cost the same amount to educate all children. Some students, especially those with special needs, it's more expensive to educate them. So we should consider that in the formula. And then finally, when this was put into place in 1980, things were much different in the classroom. I was eight years old that year, and we had blackboards in the classroom. We didn't have computers. I don't think my teachers even had a telephone in the classroom. Now many of our classrooms have one-to-one -one technology. You have these great CTE programs in our high school. It's much more expensive to educate a student now. So the third piece of my bills would be to rebase the school year from the 79-80 school year to the current school year. The other thing that I wanted to call to your attention is a bill that I'm co-sponsoring with Mr. Grant from up the Gilbert area. Over the last thing from, he was one of the group of people who served on a teen mental health study committee. We all know that mental health is a really important issue, especially here in the Southeast Valley where we see so many teen suicides. What this bill would do is in the school safety grants, it would add school psychologists to the, the groups of people that schools can select to choose with their grants. We'll see if it goes forward. From my perspective, things this session have been extremely slow. In the education committee, we've, we've had four weeks now in the legislature, we've only heard 10 bills. And also from my perspective, it's been very partisan. We haven't had a single Democratic bill heard in that committee. Um, this week, I was in the hallway listening to a freshman member of the majority, and she was really excited and I'm, I'm happy for her. She said, I've had seven bills go through committee and they've all passed. And I thought, oh my, in the entire House of Representatives, we have not had that many Democratic bills that didn't have a hearing. We've had three. So the hyper-partisanship is playing out. It's really sad because we represent all people. We represent Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. And it would be really nice if some of our bills were being heard. So I will stop there and I look forward to interacting with you more. You always can reach out to my office and have to meet with you. Thank you. Like, you know, budget is going to be in mind, so it sounds like that might be the one thing for the cross the aisle as a priority from everybody. That's what I heard. We're not going to have time for questions at least not because we need to move forward with the program, so maybe we have time to do some questions. But you're not welcome. Our 2023 20, Chamber Board Chair for April is from today. Thanks, Elin. Um, we want to use just in case. We'll, 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 see, we'll see how it goes. I, I just want to say thanks again to our elected representatives for being here. What a, uh, what a public service to serve in public office. Uh, sometimes there's no good answer to the question. And, and at, the, at the House and the Senate, there is no maybe button. It's either red or green, and you have to choose whether that decision is a good one or a bad one. Sometimes there are no good decisions. So thank you for your service to our state. We really do appreciate it. Two of my good friends here that I want to do a, a quick introduction on, and I told Terry I'm going to try to stick to the script as best I can. Uh, but we're going to take a little deeper dive into the questions uh, focused around Arizona and some of the things that we're facing with these gentlemen. Um, in 2006, 
Chad Campbell was elected to the Arizona legislature where he served eight years in the state house, representing parts of downtown Phoenix, East Phoenix, West Phoenix, and Scottsdale. In his second term, he was elected to serve as the caucus whip. He was later elected to serve as the House Democratic leader, becoming one of the youngest minority leaders in the history of Arizona. Please help me welcome Chad. All right, so our next speaker is uh, Chuck Kaufman. Chuck is a five-time winner as Arizona's best political operative, awarded by the Arizona Capital Times. He served as Governor Brewer's transition chairman for her 2009 transition team and was, and was the campaign manager for Governor Simington's 1994 re-election campaign, which overcame a post-Labor Day double-digit deficit to win the election. Under his leadership, High Ground has won over 50 awards in campaigns and elections and the American Association of Political Consultants. Please help me. Welcome, Chuck. And just as a side note, yes, Terry, I'm going off script. So again, I've known these two gentlemen many, many years. Uh, Chad and I served in the House of Representatives together from different parties. We actually sat on the floor next to each other for uh, several of those years. And uh, uh, Chad has been in the service of the state of Arizona for many years. We do appreciate that. And Chuck and I have worked together when he was uh, working on Governor Brewer's transition team and had many other opportunities in his tenure at the legislature uh, working on Arizona's behalf. And while we haven't always agreed politically on all avenues to move Arizona forward, I can tell you without a doubt, these two gentlemen love Arizona. And they, they, they want to see Arizona move forward, and they're working to that end. And we do appreciate you being here today and talking about the policy. So thank you. So, uh, is your mic on? It should be lit up if we're going to do stuff. So. Okay, yeah. awesome. So, they get it on there. Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right. <clears throat> so, let's get started. Arizona has become the third highest migrant state after Texas and Florida. How do you see the landscape of Arizona changing? Yeah, I'm going to leave this one. Yeah, uh, thanks. Can you all hear me? Is that good? All right. Uh, it's a loaded question here to start off with. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So I think there's a lot of changes that are going on demographically, right? Uh, to the point of the question, we have a lot of people coming in from other states. Uh, and it used to be, I think, a very specific area where we saw most of the immigration to this state. A lot of Midwesterners, right? <clears throat> uh, but that's that's changed over the past few years. You're seeing people come in from California, uh, which I was told they need. Be careful what you wish for. I told them that back in the day when I was down there, because uh, they always said, "Let's attract people from California." She said, "Let's come in from California, Oregon, Washington, some other places." Uh, it's not just that you know that the Chicago Cubs fans that we all love. It's a bunch of new people coming in. Uh, and that's changing the name of, of the state. And then you're also seeing the growth of the state just from uh, population boom here. Uh, you know, we have, we have a very, we always talk about the older population in Arizona. We're also one of the younger states, though, in the country now. We have a very young population here. Uh, they have a very different set of priorities. And they're becoming more engaged in politics. We're seeing that election after election. Uh, this last cycle, we saw the lines at ASU, for instance, where people wanted to go and vote, students. Um, so that's going to start changing the, the political dynamics, or you're seeing that in the outcome of some of these state elections, especially. Uh, you know, we have the top three statewide offices are all Democratic for the first time in decades. Uh, we have, you know, we have two senators who aren't Republicans. I guess that's the best way to frame it now. Uh, so, you know, things have changed, um, and that's going to continue. I, I hear some people on, on my side saying, like, we're a blue state now. We are not a blue state, and I want to stress that. We're not a blue state. Uh, I think we're barely a purple state. Uh, but what it's coming down to, my own particular opinion here, is that the, the, the swing voters, and there's a bunch of swing voters in the state. I know Chuck will talk about this probably. But, you know, you have uh, the Latino population, educated suburban folks. Uh, they are looking, quite frankly, to put in very simplistic terms, for more moderate candidates focused on key issues. That's what they want to talk about, that's what they want to hear about, the economy, water, we can add more water, right? 
education. Some of those key hot button issues that, you know, quite frankly, I think a lot of voters feel have been left behind by uh, previous administrations and others. So that's going to drive the conversation. I don't think it's going to be so much uh, R versus D in the traditional sense here over the next couple cycles. It's going to be what kind of candidate is out there talking about the key issues that matter to Arizonans. And if you're talking about those issues in a sensible way, you're going to get traction. I'm talking about the statewide level. Legislature told everything we talked about that. Uh, but we're not, we're not a blue state, we're not a red state. Uh, I think we're a center, slightly right-leaning state, moderate right-leaning state still for the most part. But again, if Democrats run uh, very nonpartisan, like very moderate campaigns that focus on center-left issues, they can win, it, which is what we did in this last segment, which is why we took this top three statewide officers. Chef John, your thoughts? Well, um, first, thanks to Terry and uh, for uh, Ward. Uh, love being out back in Chandler. Uh, you know, I moved out here in 1985 to work for Senator McCain, or then Congressman McCain in his first Senate campaign. And uh, I remember uh, buying a house in Chandler in 1990. That house now doesn't exist because it was bulldozed by the 202 freeway. Um, and that says a lot, right? I mean, literally, that was not, you know, that was 30 years ago. And so it's incredible the amount of growth. I had breakfast with JD or lunch with JD at the end of the 202 corridor. Uh, you know, I hadn't been out here and I was like, holy moly. I mean, it's unbelievable the change that has happened in the community. Uh, I remember when I was working for John um, and when I worked for Grant, I worked for Grant when he was the attorney general. You know, we drive into South Tempe and it was all cotton fields. It was uh, cotton fields all the way down here. Uh, and the community has transformed. Uh, when I went to work for when we did Governor Brewer's um, transition, it was still pretty much a home building uh, based economy. Retirees, home builders, military employees. Uh, but what's happened over the last decade has transformed the state into a industrial and technological hub uh, that is really attractive to a lot of employers, thanks to the leadership of JD and other people at the Capitol in creating a low tax environment that's very attractive to businesses and relocating folks out here. Uh, and you can see that around Gateway, the airport out in the East Valley, uh, it is exploded. Uh, you can see that with your corridor here with Intel uh, and the 101 corridor that comes down. Now you can see that on the 303 corridor in the East Valley. Uh, and I'll talk about this, I think, in a future question about our transportation system here um, and what a blessing it is. It's an incredible blessing to the community. Uh, and so it's here's something that I, I constantly say. Um, I know Governor Ducey is very proud of his accomplishments, and he had a good eight years of wind at his back. Not every governor has that. Uh, when he worked for Jan, it was not great. Uh, we had a you know, a $3 billion budget deficit that we inherited at that time. Uh, when Fife was in office, we, uh, you know, we had the savings and loan crisis and the crash there. Um, but consistently, the economy in Arizona grows. It will continue to grow. People will come here. And we have to have that thinking and that planning mentality. And luckily, we have a city manager form of government. That, that forces a dialogue about how we continue to grow and plan. We have planning statutes that require communities to develop family plans that Mayor, Mayor Harkey and council work on that is really attractive to growth. Um, and we've set the groundwork for that in our communities to accommodate for the growth that's gonna come. Uh, and you know the, the other big issue is the immigration um, problem crisis uh, that's continued as long as I can remember. And I mean, it is absolutely broken. Uh, it is a partisan problem. Uh, it is uh, in the sense that, you know, Republicans want border security, Democrats want immigration. Well, shocker, we need both. Uh, and the political system we have right now doesn't lend itself to those both discussions. Uh, and we can talk about that later too. But um, you know, we have a problem. Mexico is our largest trading partner. You have uh, Central American governments and South American governments that have collapsed. 
uh, democracy has failed in South America and South and Central America. People are going to continue to come here um, until we, and we have to fix that problem. Uh, it's not a partisan problem. It is a, it is a generational problem that we have, and we need to hold our elected officials accountable to fixing both the immigration issue. Well, look around, we're all getting older and uh, the country's getting older. We need an influx of labor and growth in order to uh, fulfill the dreams of our economy. The American dream is still there for a lot of people and we need to fix that problem. Um, and so it's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of compromise, again, not something that lends itself in our current political situation. But, uh, you know, I love this state. I love being here. It's been a total blessing to be a part of the, you know, 1985 to now, because uh, it is an unbelievable experience. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. All right, next question. The uh, nationwide focus on the past Arizona elections has put Arizona in the spotlight. Do you feel this extra political attention will boost our economy and business? <laughs> I mean, what, what is attractive about it is it does cause this kind of conversation. Um, it, it says what is happening. And Maricopa County is changing. So it used to be that, you know, you put an R in front of your name in Maricopa County. When I was growing up here, it was a lot. You were one, you, you won, um, you know, eight, with the exception of one uh, supervisory district, everybody, every row officer, everybody was going to be elected as a Republican. Well, we built three ways. We've, been, we've recruited all these businesses. We, our income level has gone way up. Um, and really what you look at is, and it's fascinating to really look at, is the 202 and the 101 corridor, and you look at voting behaviors. And the voting behaviors of that corridor have gone, as Chad mentioned earlier, purple. It's where Kirsten won in 2018. It's where Kelly won in 20. Uh, it's where uh, we can, and where they continue to win in 22, where the statewide candidates uh, on the Democratic side prevail because it's not that partisan, hardcore partisan area, and it's part of your district and the growth into this quarter. We're down here right now. And so, you know, you have to acknowledge that when you run a statewide campaign. 64% of the election in Arizona, electorate in Arizona lives in this county. Um, and so how Maricopa County goes, so goes the state pretty much. Um, there's only been one candidate that ever lost Maricopa County and won a statewide election. That was the superintendent of public instruction, uh, Diane, whatever, uh, who actually won, uh, won the race, but lost Maricopa County. And it just doesn't happen. Um, it, greater Arizona has grown. It, is, it continues to grow. Um, and it is a bastion of more conservative, which is what you would expect in, uh, in a less uh, urban area. Um, and, and Pima County is always what Pima County is going to be. Pima County is those people south of the Gila. They think different than everybody else in the state. <laughs> and they act different than everybody else in the state. I was called Tucson, uh, Mexico's northernmost town. Uh, and uh, it sort of acts it. And so it's, uh, and they're a client, so you don't repeat that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy that uh, give and take. And so in that respect, it has caused a lot of discussion about what's happening within the media. Um, and I can't tell you how many interviews I do all the time because I've been doing this business for 40 years. I don't do candidate campaigns anymore because they're way too painful. Um, it's just way too much anxiety, you know, taking the call at midnight and arguing with somebody. I just cannot do it anymore. I'll do initiative campaigns. We'll do um, city council races because they're nonpartisan. All of those. We'll do school board elections and bond elections. But it's just too, too difficult. And this environment we've fallen into, Ms. Harris spoke to this, so a significant part of the electorate doubts our election system. Um, that's a problem. That's a, that's a continuing problem. So how do we address that? There's a bunch of bills down there. 
Right now, Stephen Richard put out a bunch of ideas to promote a more rapid counting. You know, we had 290,000 people drop their early ballot off at the poll on election day. <clears throat> you got to verify that signature. It's got to go to a verification board. It's got to go through all this process and then be counted. So it's at least three days that it's going to take to get those results uh, from those. So what do we do? Do we keep the polling place open, you know, Sunday, uh, Saturday, and Friday, let people drop them off, and then come to election day, if you want to drop it off, you just got to vote. You just got to, you know, you got to vote. Um, you can't just vote the same ballot because they're different ballots. And so uh, there's a challenge there. I bet the legislature is going to deal with that as a, uh, in this session, I hope to fix some of those problems and come up with some solutions, but it's not all bad. You know, I, I, I you know, I love the idea that, you know, we're just crazy town in Arizona, but I, I really look forward. I, I ran the Martin Luther King campaign when we lost. I had to explain to Dan Rather why the Martin Luther King campaign lost in Arizona. So, and that's because the legislature put two holidays on the ballot and we split the, we split the yes vote. And they said, a majority of people voted for the MLK on it. Um, but you know, it's it's always been that way. You know, Arizona is a little uh, unique, which is what I love. And uh, you just take advantage of it. You take advantage of the opportunity. And can you explain this to me? Jack. Uh, yeah. So we're to follow up with them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll be a little more general. I would say we have some serious issues here, right? Again, I mentioned one a minute ago. Water is by far the most serious issue we are facing. We just saw, you know, earlier this week, California didn't agree to the basin cuts, the, the, I mean, the river cuts, everybody else agreed to in the basin. Uh, the feds are coming to do something. We don't know what that is. I mean, I get calls, and, and I just get calls from not just the media, but my friends all across the country saying, you know, what is going on in Arizona? What are you going to do in the future? Uh, that is the single biggest issue we face in Arizona if we want to continue to grow. There is no way around it. And the, the economic activities to be impacted the most by this is not residential, it's not commercial, it's ag. That's the, the thing that nobody wants to talk about. Agriculture is going to disappear in Arizona. We don't figure this out. There's no way around it. It's devastating, not just Arizona, but to the country. Uh, and that is the fight to between us in California, Imperial Valley versus Colorado, or I mean Yuma, and that whole area, right? That's the fight. But, but everything we're doing, I guess, we're doing, everything we're doing that distracts from those big issues. So, you know, I don't want to get into the, the fight about the election stuff right now. I think most people know my views on that. But that detracts us from what we should be focused on. Uh, and, and if we continue to go down this pathway of, of entertaining these conspiracy ideas and, and, and really just kind of putting them on a the platform, I saw another national story today about Carrie Lake. And it was not putting Arizona in a good light. Let's leave it at that then we're going to continue to tarnish our image nationally. And so we have to get away from that. We have to focus on AEL. I know that Rep. Paula talked about, we have to focus on, on our economy as a whole, we have to focus on generating new business activity, right? The immigration issue is a big issue. I agree with Chuck on that one. Uh, the border issue is a big issue. That's a federal issue for the most part, that we cannot do that on our own at the state level. That is a federal issue. And we'll see, Senator Senum, I think, was very close last year to putting together a deal on that. I don't know if she'll be able to pull it off now with the change in the House, the federal level, but that is something that has to be addressed at the federal level. You have to Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> that would be, be the most neat pairing of all time right there. <laughs> especially if you're in Right. Yeah. Uh, wow, well, yeah, okay, we should bet on that one. Uh, so, so, you know, but that's a federal issue. We have to, we have to tackle both. We have to tackle border security. You have to tackle <laughs> a fair and legal process to opening up immigration to people who want to come here and find the American dream. You have to do both. They cannot be exclusionary one another. So these are the things we should focus on, not, not the election denialism, not these other conspiracy theories, uh, you know, not these hot button, I like to call them these hot button issues that, that get everybody up, make everybody angry about something that probably affects one person, quite frankly. Uh, and we spend a lot of time, a lot of noise on that, and it really doesn't matter to 90 95% of Arizona. So that's what I was before. If anybody down at the Capitol, it doesn't matter what party you're on, uh, Republican, Democrat, whatever, focus on the issues that matter. And I know I'm not saying just focus on one issue. You can you know, walk into them at the same time. You have to as a legislator. But focus on the issues that matter. Get those out of the way first. 
or as quickly as possible, and then deal with the other stuff if you want. Uh, but don't let those things that, that generate that bad press and generate that skepticism, don't let those fester. And that's what we continue to do, especially around the election stuff. Uh, and I, I hope we can move past that after this segment. The session should be it. Let's move on. Thanks, Chad. Well, you guys have the first couple of questions were loaded. We're ready for this <laughs> and, and, I, and I know both of you have already mentioned this briefly in, in, in comments you've made, but uh, Arizona voters just split the top three executive branch positions. Um, how is that going to affect upcoming legislation and the temperament of the legislature? Chad, leave this one up. jeez. Uh, um, I have a little bit of experience about this actually in some way, because my first two years in that ledge were the last two years of Governor Napolitano's term. So, uh, you know, same kind of situation that, as my Democratic friends were facing right now. We had a Democratic minority at the Capitol, although we had much lower numbers than you all had, which was depressing for us. Uh, and we had a Democratic governor. Uh, you know, what we did very early on in that, in that two years, uh, and before my time they were doing it too, was, you know, there was a coalition of Democrats and Republicans who built what I would say is kind of a circle of trust. They could talk in a constructive way, uh, they could work on issues together, they, they could share information without knowing it, which this is before Twitter, so I guess it wasn't Twitter back then, but, but you know, it's not lasting on Twitter, they could actually talk and work together. Uh, I think at one point uh, we call it the mushroom caucus because everybody met in the basement. The mushroom caucus is a pizza caucus because we only take one pizza. Yeah, that was my caucus. The pizza caucus. We had 20 members one night. So yeah, that was the running too much. You wonder what pizza you know, all this is. Depressing and funny all at the same time. So you know, but that that group though built a lot of trust with each other, and that was the thing. So even if we disagreed with each other, we wouldn't go out there and blast it to the media. Wouldn't go out there on the floor and do dirty laundry. Uh, you try to work towards compromise and constructive solution. And so I hope that starts to take place down there now. Uh, but but I will say this is going to be a lot of grandstanding right now. There is that's that's the process, right? Uh, you're you're going to get a lot of vetoes. I keep joking this session going to be veto 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 budget, and then it's going to be done. Uh, and I only have to when I say that. But there's going to be a lot of back and forth, a lot of grandstanding. Both sides are going to test each other out, and that's the way it works. I don't blame them. Uh, the Republicans are going to test the new governor. They're going to send up that continuation budget. I think it's going to be sent back down pretty quickly, is my guess, or significantly altered, one of the two. Uh, and, and the governor's going to do the same thing back to the Republicans. So it's going to be a little bit of, of touch and go for a while. But my hope is this, that you have a group of legislators, because this is the key, that come together and can build trust in each other and work in some type of constructive way with the governor's office. Uh, you know, I like to say you put the adults in the room and they can craft something that actually is meaningful and actually tackles all of those issues I just kind of touched on. Uh, it's going to take a while, though. Uh, I think they're going to be down there until till June 30th, is my guess, maybe beyond. Uh, so sorry, you can break that news all of you. Don't make the summer vacation plans. <laughs> um, but I hope that's what happens. And I, again, I think that the biggest difference though between when I was down there, I sound like the, the old guy who walked up both ways and with no shoes on now. <laughs> so, but the biggest difference is we didn't have social media when I first got elected. It's kind of a, a, a new development video after 2010 when I kind of picked up. But those first years we had that split government, we didn't have that social media. And that's changed the landscape of politics. And I would really, 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 I tell this all the time to people, if you're an elected official, get out of your Twitter bubble. Twitter is not the real world. It is a small percentage of very loud people. That's what it is. And they do not reflect, it does not reflect the vast majority of Arizonans. I don't care what party you are. So, thanks, Chad. Chuck, your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the Senate president su uh, suggested they're going to send up a budget. Um, I get that. They're, that's a psychological tool for them to draw their caucus together to create unity in the caucus so they have a negotiated position they can start from and they think that that's going to put the governor in some deficit position politically because she'll veto that budget and they'll say well that's you know you, you vetoed the budget which we then could continue to negotiate on but the governor's not going to give up the leverage in that situation and just hand it over to uh, to a, a Republican legislature that could adjourn. 
I mean, they could adjourn without addressing any of her priorities um, before the budget. So she's going to veto the budget. Um, and so that should come as a shock to no one. Um, and they could do that at the end of the session, too, they, which would actually maybe be a better strategic political play, because at least then if they get into that situation at the end of the June, they could actually have the threat of a government shutdown and sending people home. Um, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Um, there are, uh, so, so think about this. Um, the last two budgets were done by the, speak, the current Speaker of the House, Ben Tomlin. Um, he was the majority leader in the House last time. He is very capable of getting a bipartisan budget done. He did it the last two years. Um, and so he knows that. Uh, I saw him the other day and I laughed uh, out loud. I'm like, how'd you get him to pass that rule? So they passed a rule that said that the speaker's got to be on the winning side of any budget, of any bill that comes off the floor. And he goes, they wanted that. I go, well, did they watch the history of the last two years that you cut the deal with the Democrats? And he goes, yeah, I don't think there's a lot of wisdom about that. Uh, and so um, the other thing that's going on is you have somebody help me in the room, 39 new members, I think, down there. That's crazy. I mean, that's a that's so many new people that are trying to figure out the process, figure out who to talk to, who to trust, um, staff-wise, you know, how the process works. Uh, and it's very complicated. And inside each of those caucuses, it can get pretty nasty personally. Um, and so Chad's point about social media is absolutely spot on. Uh, but doesn't matter. They'll still be going to go off and trash one another. Uh, and it's going to take an adult in the room to, to sit there and say to them, maybe that's not a great idea to do right now. Let's continue to talk as a group and figure out our way through this. Um, so there's lots of complicated twists and turns in the session as it moves forward. Um, I will say this. I think there's a group uh, down there that have done the budgets the last two years, um, leading with uh, Speaker Toma, um, that will be capable of getting something done um, and will execute on a budget at the end of the session. There was a pretty complicated vote in the Senate on the Senate presidency um, uh, prior to you know, how Mr. Peterson got elected. I think that left some scars in the Republican caucus over there. So there's some people, I think, there that will be willing to navigate uh, uh, on how to get to a budget. Um, but you're not going to see that appear until the end of June when all the pressure's on and everybody's, you know, white knuckling it through the process that way. Thank you. Yeah, I believe. Uh, uh, both of you will remember this. There was a budget, I believe it was four or five, that uh, the clocks were stopped uh, in the uh, in, on the floor to make sure that it didn't tick over to July first. Nope. Uh, Literally, that's the true story. It's not the clock. It was, it was, it was negotiated out and uh, that worked out. So um, Arizona has always been fiercely independent. Though. We're, we're talking about split government. We're talking about these different things. Back in 2003, uh, Chad mentioned this real quickly, we came in with a new Democrat governor, Napolitano, and an attorney general at the time, Terry Goddard. But on the, in the House and the Senate, we, the Republicans also had almost super majority numbers in each of those chambers. So Arizona's always been this way. It's not that even with the growth and, and the influx of people, we've always been fiercely independent. And that's something to be very proud of. I mean, because of that, we see Salt River Project, we see CAP, we see some of these things that other states, however they exactly have failed to do and not done, but would have done in Arizona. So we're running short on time. I'm going to ask one final question, if that's okay. Did you have something, Chuck? Okay, okay. So, hey, this, this, is, this, is a, this is an easy one, and this is the guy. It's like at the legislature. It's like at the legislature. You ask a legislator a question in committee. And you might get that answer after they tell you everything else. I've run, I've run it up to you. Yeah, yeah. So this 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 will be a fun question for you guys. So get your crystal ball out. 
and give us your thoughts on the Arizona U.S. Senate race. Okay, that's, a, that's an exciting question. Sure. Okay. I'll leave us up. Uh, before I get to that, I'm going to remind everybody that Prop 400, uh, the extension that everybody talked about today, is up. Um, uh, that's going to expire. We ran the campaign in 04. We got it passed through the legislature in 04. Um, so what that is, 1986, um, the region passed the half cent sales tax to fund our regional transportation system. So what built the 202, the 101, the 303, bought all the right of way, did all of that, was that tax. It was renewed in 2004, and we created the first region transportation. Uh, transit system, regional transit system as a result of that. Because as you would guess, some cities have different transportation needs. Phoenix really doesn't need a whole lot of new freeways, neither does Tempe. So you have much more congested patterns. So you need transit dollars, you need light rail dollars, you need trolley dollars, you need other money. Um, and we, we're now in the legislature and they're going to pass a bill next week that's going to eliminate all the transit funding. Um, that that will die at the ballot. It will lose um, if it goes to the ballot because those communities will vote overwhelmingly no against it. You put that with the anti-tax crowd to begin with, that's enough to defeat it. Um, you know, there's way, y'all ought to pay attention to that issue. Mr. Sellers in the back is the chairman uh, of the Transportation Committee uh, at MAG, um, and we're all working hard to get that done, but it's a critically important thing if the region, as you just said, wants to continue to grow. Um, crystal ball. Uh, so here's the deal. Um, Ruben's going to run. We saw that. He'll be the only Democrat in the field. He'll win uh, in, the, in the campaign. His campaign will be incredibly negative uh, about um, Kirsten. Um, it's going to lay down a narrative about how he's a working man, and, and it's, it's got a lot of truth to his narrative about who he is uh, and his background. Um, and but he's a much more progressive Democrat than Kirsten is. I would I would venture to say that if he were to be elected, he'd be the most uh, progressive Democrat ever to be elected on a statewide ballot in Arizona. Um, so what is he counting on? Well, a I think he's counting on Kirsten not running. I do not believe that's going to be the case. I'm, I think I'm in a minority of people when I say that, but I, I do know she hates Ruben, and Ruben hates her, and he is a massive motivator <laughs> to help people out. Uh, and she loves her job. She loves what she's doing right now. She loves cutting these deals and being in this very unique position in the U.S. Senate. So I believe she will run. So let's leave that alone for a second. Then the Republicans will nominate a nominee. If they nominate another MAGA nominee, as they did in this last slate of candidates that ran on the statewide ticket, that's Kirsten Sinema's best friend because it will create an opportunity for, as we saw in this last cycle, 20 to 30 percent of Republicans um, vacate that top seat. They will not go there. Um, along with unaffiliated voters. In order to win a statewide election in Arizona, you have to win a plurality of unaffiliated voters. Um, the last cycle was 43 Republican, 34 uh, 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 Democrat, and 28 Independent, 24, don't do math to me. Um, but, uh, so you can't win a race with just one party or the other. Have to win those unaffiliated voters. So the, the race becomes about where those unaffiliated voters. I have not seen unaffiliated voters support a MAGA candidate since they voted for Trump in 16. They've just walked away from that ticket um, uh, consistently in that period of time. So in order to win, you've got to look again at that unaffiliated. Who the Republicans nominate is critical. If they nominate somebody with the ability to narrate a campaign to those unaffiliated voters and keep the Republican Party unified, that's almost a lock for them to win the race. So a Republican will win, will win the race um, because Democrats will divide to some extent 
um, uh, will divide the Democratic base, and Kirsten will get a good chunk of unaffiliated voters. So how does Kirsten win? Kirsten wins uh, by doing this. She wins by getting 20% to 25% of Democrats, 25 to 30% of Republicans, and 60% of independents. That's the coalition she needs to win. That's about 43% of the statewide vote. That's a win for her. Um, and uh, that, because that's all you need in a three-way race, that's, that's all you really need. Um, super hard campaign to run. How do you get 60% of independents to agree on anything? That's a really difficult thing to do. How does she get 25% or 20% of Democrats to stick with her when Ruben is going to be savaging her on the, on the left? Um, but what she will have to do is narrate a campaign from the very beginning of the cycle. So she has to be the issue. If her, she's the issue, so an independent candidate never wins a race because they're never talked about until the general election happens um, and everybody else just goes out. She's an incumbent, so she will narrate a story about why she is doing what she's doing from the very beginning of the race um, and, and creating an environment where Ruben and whoever the Republican is has to respond to her narrative. If she doesn't do that, which I know she's going to do that, I've talked to people and they know that she has to do that. If she doesn't do that, just kiss it goodbye. It's done. Um, but she she's smart. She's a wicked hard campaigner. I mean, I've never, uh, Jan Brewer was the hardest campaigner I've ever met. She's number two. She works her tail off. But she's got to figure out how to get in front of audiences and big audiences and talk to people. She's abandoned the Democratic, you know, open town, open hall type thing because that's the Democratic audience to savage her. So she's going to have to figure out a way to get in front of a lot of people and talk to a lot of people um, on a broad stage uh, and talk about what her narrative is going to be. I am fascinated. I am absolutely busted out the popcorn on this one. Because it is going to be super cool to watch this race unfold and watch how every candidate narrates their campaign and what they end up doing. Uh, and I'm I'm super excited about it. Jet. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, to, I'll start with this. The numbers that Chuck just talked about in terms of what she needs to win. So if you look at the polling that's come out since her announcement uh, of becoming independent, those numbers are where she stands, actually. It's about in the 30 percentile range in terms of approval from Democrats, above 30 with Republicans, and around 50 with independents. Um, so those numbers are actually doable. <clears throat> and so, you know, for those of you who know, I've known Senator Cinema for 22 years. I ran her first campaign for the legislature. Her and I were seatmates. She was a friend of mine. I met her for three weeks ago. Uh, Did you I'm tell him where that tutu? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that was before my picture. But I would say this to Chuck when I would send it. I think those that are assuming she's not going to run again are, are miscalculating her possibly. Now, I don't know if she's going to run again or not. She's not telling me that. Uh, but I, I will say this also about anybody who people have been doing this since the first time she ran for office. People have underestimated her ability to make things happen for 20 years. <laughs> and I think a lot of people are doing that again right now. I know Ruben too very well. He and I were, we, he and I were in leadership together in the house. Ruben's a friend of mine as well. I talked to Ruben a couple weeks ago. Um, and Ruben, much like Chuck said, is also a very hard worker. He's a very good campaigner. Um, he's going to play to the base. That's what he's going to do. He's already doing it. Um, but if, if, if Kirsten does decide to run, we're going to see something we've never seen before, I think, in, in the nation's history, not just in Arizona, history, in the nation's history. Uh, and people are clamoring for independence from partisan politics right now. That's true. I don't care who you ask. And she is going to test that theory, I think, in full force. Um, and it's going to be a fascinating race to watch, like Chuck said. I'm, I'm a little more, I'm not as happy about this as Chuck is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as thrilling as me, or for me as a Chuck, because I know both of them. <clears throat> but regardless, um, and I'm convinced, I, I mean, again, I'm not trying to disparage my, my GOP friends, but I'm convinced that the GOP is incapable of not nominating a MAGA candidate. I just don't think it can happen yet. 
And if that happens, to Chuck's point, that does give Kirsten the lane she needs. Period. Um, It'll be fascinating to see what she does over the next few months. And I think we will know by probably summer whether or not she's going to run. We'll see how the fundraising goes for both her and Ruben over the next few months. I hear she's filed all the paperwork, all that stuff. But the one thing that nobody's talking about is everybody gets this goes back to Twitter. Everybody gets back to Twitter. They get back to their 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 partisan, tribalistic kind of whatever you want to call it, roots, right? And we all look at Twitter, and, oh my god, Democrats hate Pierce, and then the GOP loves Great Lake, and blah 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 blah. Um, but you know, people think Kirsten is somebody always is seeking attention. This is something that I want to, I'm going to, she's the exact opposite. That, that's actually her biggest problem. So when Kirsten starts campaigning and what she's actually accomplished over the past two years, she's the most accomplished U.S. Senator in the country. <laughs> that's not even a contest. And if Joe Biden starts running again, he's going to need Arizona, right? He has to have Arizona. And what is Joe Biden going to talk about in Arizona? every major piece of legislation he's passed and who led the negotiations on every major piece of legislation he passed every single one who's the senator they're going to be inextricably linked and there is no way joe biden can trash kirsten cinema in a primary or contest and there's no way the voters will connect those dots no way and you're seeing it right now. I told a bunch of reporters early on, if Ruben announces, all the supporters are calling me. How soon is he meeting before Schumer comes out and support Ruben and Biden? I'll say, you're going to hear radio silence from the Democrats in these days. And that's what you're hearing. Nobody said a bad word about Kirsten in these days because they need her. <laughs> they do. And again, I'm not taking sides for this. I'm not me taking sides of being it's an honest political assessment. They need her. They know they need her. Um, and, and again, if Biden runs, if Biden runs for re-election, it's the best thing that can happen for, for senators in him. Because again, he's going to be out there touting all the legislation that he passed, everything, including getting billions of dollars for drought mitigation for the Southwest, Southwest United States, which you know who got that money in that package? Here's some stuff. And when she starts talking about these things, and I talk to mayors all over the city or all over the, the, the state a lot, they love Kirsten. <laughs> Because she's bringing money into their towns. Um, so I don't know where it's going to go. It's, it's a very difficult hill for Kirsten to climb. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't want to sit there and say, by any means, it's not deal for anybody. And, and, and it's, it's going to be probably one of the most difficult races you'll ever see in the Senate for an independent point in a three way race. But my point is, to Chuck's point, is I think people that are calculating or assuming she's not going to run are probably miscalculating or possibly miscalculating. And I do think the people that are assuming if she does run, it's an automatic loss or definitely miscalculated. A lot of it will depend again on, to me, two things. Who the Republicans nominate and does Joe Biden run for re-election? But if those two things happen, then it is a game changer in terms of the entire narrative, what will happen in the center race. So it'll be fascinating to see. And, and I think I won't say as strongly as Chuck said it, but uh, there is no loss of love between Senator Sinema and Congressman Guy. That's no big secret. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I would say this, I don't think it's just going to be, um, you know, Congressman Guy going negative against Senator Senema. I think there's going to be a lot of negativity back at him as well. That's my prediction. Uh, and ultimately, again, in, in normal circumstances, that would help out the Republican nominee. And if the Republicans nominate somebody like a Karen Hill Robeson, then that does help out the nominee. But again, if it's a MAGA candidate, I, I don't think, uh, I, I should say, that if it's a MAGA candidate, it definitely helps out Senema as well. So, it's going to be fascinating. Again, I'm not going to be uh, eating popcorn and drinking beer like Chuck is. I'm going to be probably drunk on candy. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to be hiding, I'm going to be hiding from the media and taking out your program from it. Thanks to you both, and Chuck, I'll eat popcorn and drink beer. Thank you so much for your insight. Thank you for being here. Let's give a round. Closing, I'd like to bring up Russ. Uh, work to just say a few words. Uh, hopefully, my voice will hold up because I was sick much more recently than uh, well, than yesterday, actually. So, uh, I'm Russ with Electric Technology Solutions, and I'm on the public policy committee as well. With uh, thanks, Liz, for uh, bringing me up here. Uh, so right now, I'd like to invite any other elected officials we have in the room that haven't spoken to. Say something if they want to. Uh, Jack, you want to say something? 
Well, I'll just mention that uh, so Chuck teed up a couple hundred extension is very well for me. Uh, the thing that, that I have to emphasize to everybody is, you know, we've done a phenomenal job of economic development. $60 billion in the last 12 months announced for this area. We don't have a plan in place for the infrastructure to support that expansion that's already been announced, let alone the companies that will come to support the, the two companies that are doing those, those major expansions. So we have to get this passed and it needs to get this year. The thing that people don't understand is that, you know, because Prop 400 doesn't expire until 2020, the end of 2025, they think we have time. The fact of the matter is to have something on our plan in Arizona, you have to have funding in place to have the bonding for that to even be in the plan. And so without the extension of Prop 400 now, uh, we, we have projects that have already been delayed. And in fact, MAG estimates that it's already cost us like $200 million for what's been delayed so far. Amen, Jack. Thanks for all your work on this. <laughs> this guy is working on it. Gary, do you want to say anything? Just quickly, um, this week is the next the mayor had to leave as, as well as the vice mayor. So oh, it's all right. Right. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we uh, had a great productive week uh, this week with Mayor and Council and our staff on our council retreat. Uh, we're basically setting our priorities for our strategic framework for the next few years for our council port city. And we had a great collaboration of our ideas and now, I don't want to say reinventing, but reinventing the idea of channeling the city of innovation. What does that look like to us now here in 2023 and what it's going to look like in the future um, for the next 10 to 20 years? So we had some great work together and great collaboration. So look forward to some good stuff with the city. My name is Kurt Roy, I'm with the Chandler uh, Unified School District, I'm on the board. So it's uh, my personal opinion that the, the driving focus in the school district should be career opportunities and explain what you start to get. This is absolutely crucial to workforce development, economic development. <laughs> so I believe this is a really pragmatic approach to what we're doing. It's apolitical, it's not emotional, very rational. It has tangible outputs, which is a professional license degree or certification that we get out of our schools. It also does a lot to explain to our parents who make decisions whether kids go to school and our kids why they're going to our schools. And I think we need to make this very clear to them. So getting the focus back on and expanding the focus on career development and driving it all the way through the school system, I think this is where we should be focusing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patti Serrano, and I too am a board member here at Chandler Unified. And I would just echo what the big theme of today was with funding our education. We're very eager in our school districts throughout the state to be able to utilize allocated funds. The money's there, but we need the AEL to be waived so we can actually put them to use just to complete this school year. So it's, it's definitely an urgent matter. So I would encourage everybody here, reach out to our legislators to make sure that we do pass the um, HCR 2001, I believe, that we need to see that wave just to get through this school year. And we still have to figure out future years, of course, and policy related, I'm also supporting um, HB 2238, that is actually a bill right now that would provide funding for all school meals in our public schools throughout the state. We talked about the 9% inflation rate. It's hitting our families really hard. If we want to relieve families and give them some cash to spend in our small businesses and our communities, this would definitely help with that. So we're looking to fund um, school meals throughout all our public schools through this bill. Thank you. Is there anyone that I missed from our elected officials? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you again to all of our presenters. Any further questions can be directed by the chamber. 
uh, either Terry or one of the members of the committee. Um, and thank you, everyone who was uh, to, uh, was here uh, sponsoring uh, Terraprox, Chemicals, APS, AT Valley Consulting, Palos Computer Technologies, for the uh, Gemma Regional, uh, Dragon Walk, Fine Chinese Restaurant, Hotel, and Silver. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, I'm